on today's Run to the Top podcast. What I do is fierce and sexy, not how I look doing it. I don't know why we can't still see a very muscular body as attractive in women. It's, oh, she's muscular. She's pretty, she's muscular. Or with our throwers, people go, oh, wow, she's actually a pretty girl. Well, why wouldn't she be a pretty girl? Like, you you hear these things and you're just kind of, she's out there as an athlete and she's hurling something through the air that I could only hope to pick up off the ground. And you're shocked that there's still a feminine quality to her or that she's pretty. Like, it's just, at what point are we absolutely just athletes? Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for being here with me today for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. So last week we heard from Josh Trent of Wellness Force Radio, who asked us all to challenge ourselves and try and make a behavior change that we will stick to for life. Not just a New Year's resolution that most of us have probably already given up on, but a real change that will make us all so much happier. I love the chat and if you didn't listen to it, I'm sure you will too. So today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the dark side of running. And this is going to be an episode I don't think you'll be able to forget for a while. So Lani Marchant has run 228 in the marathon, 110 in the half marathon, 3146 in the 10k and ran in the Rio Olympics last year for Canada. Although today we do talk a little bit about her running, we actually ended up mostly talking about how easy it is to fall in the trap of starving yourself to look skinny because you feel that's what a runner should look like. Lani talks about her struggles with this and how much better she started doing when she stopped punishing herself both physically and mentally. We also talk about women in the world of running and how we're going to stop this chatter about image and instead look at what these bodies are able to do as athletes. So whether you're a guy or a girl, you're going to get a lot out of this episode and it will open your eyes to a whole new perspective. So I can't wait any longer to share it with you. After a word from our sponsors, we will be right to the chat. I want to say a big thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast and for helping me with my training over the last few years. You can enter to win a pack of six perfect amino bottles for free by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Thank you to Sockany for supporting the Runs to the Top podcast. Running might be a low maintenance sport, but a good pair of running shoes is a must. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off at Sockany.com when you pick out your next pair. Welcome to the Runs to the Top podcast, Lani. Hi, thanks for having me. I am excited to have you and I know you are a guest that I've been thinking about for a while, so it's great to actually bring you on and kind of get to these uh, conversations that, uh, you know, Topics that people often aren't, are a little bit afraid to talk about or just, you know, things that aren't discussed as much as they should be. But firstly, I kind of want to begin with just a general background on you. You know, you worked your way up as a high school cross country runner. Um, And firstly, I wanted to ask about, um, you decided to go to university in the US at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. Why did you decide to go to university in the US and what was it? that kind of pulled you away from Canada? I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. I did the same thing, but for anyone listening, what was what was your reasoning for that? Uh, yeah, well, I grew up in the figure skating world. And in that world, by the time you're in high school, if you haven't made it as a skater, you're kind of done. A lot of girls get their GED and then go skate nice shows or go on to other things. Uh, I start, When I was in high school running, I, that's I transitioned into running um, I learned in about grade 10 or 11, you could get a scholarship to the U.S. if you were quick enough and if your grades were um, high enough. And as one of seven kids, it seemed quite ideal to have someone else pay for school. I knew from a young, young age, I was going to want to pursue uh, further education beyond just an undergraduate degree. And again, coming from a single parent household of seven kids, like even getting through the first degree w- was going to be problematic for in terms of finances. So that's what drew me to the U.S. system. Uh, Canada now has some more bursary programs and a few more options for people to stay within our borders. But at the time, yeah, it just 
someone else was paying for school, I would be able to pursue an education, which was very important to me and can continue to pursue running, which was also important to me. Mm -hmm. And just a random question that I'm curious about, as uh, you know, you mentioned, you heard about it when I was in school, uh, high school, that is, I was told, um, we were kind of had it drilled into our heads that if you went to the US to go to university, you would be, you know, you'd have to pound mileage, you would be racing all the time. And if you got injured, they would pretty much like kick you back and say, like, go away, we'll get someone else. What, did you have the same kind of lessons there? Or was that just my school and the way I, I'm just curious? Uh, no, you're warned that you'll be running into the ground when you get down to the US. I did my best to pick a school mm -hmm. where I wasn't going to come in and be the, 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 the all star standout right away. Um, it didn't prevent injury. It didn't prevent threats of being sent home. <laughs> um, you know, I did, I probably had the very typical foreign athlete experience in the NCAA, uh, for distance runners. Anyways, I can't speak to other sports or sprinters or anything. Uh, but I did my research and I did my best. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would do it a lot differently now in terms of expectations from coaches, et cetera, going down. But you're 17, 18, trying to make a very adult decision, and you very much think you're an adult, <laughs> and, and you're not. Um, but yeah, we're it's it's the same thing over here in Canada. We hear, oh, you know, the NCAA system just runs athletes to death, and you do see a lot of it. You see a lot that you also see where it works out, and there's runners that go on to have long, lengthy careers. But I mean, just look at the numbers. You have so many girls and guys joining the NCAA system, and how many of us make it to a post collegiate career uh, without before falling out of love with it, with running. So. Oh, absolutely. My, uh, my training partner, Sarah Crouch, she often talks about um, how she remembered being given a speech when she was, I can't remember what age, but when she was young saying about, um, and they was they said about how few people within the running world would make it to the professional ranks either because they couldn't make it uh, like, you know, ability wise, or they just, um, you know, like you said, burned out or kind of lost the, lost the, um, you know, drive to do it. So it is amazing to think about, um, the amount of college kids there are and how many actually keep going, you know, at that level. Um, and you, you know, you struggled your way through your freshman year. Um, and I just wondered if you had any theories on why so many collegiate runners struggle in that first year and then to any college runners listening, what you would tell them if they are struggling in their freshman year. Yeah, I think for me, there was a, there was a couple of things that play there. Uh, the Canadian system, we, our summer system goes quite late and I was transitioning from high school to the college system, but I still wanted to do my club track. And so I competed right up until July, I think going my transition summer before starting my freshman year. And, um, I came, came in to start the cross country season after not getting much of a break from my track season. Uh, and then there was also just, I didn't look like, and I, I, through high school, I didn't either, but for some reason, when I got to, down to the NCAA system that freshman year, I didn't look like the other girls on my team. I didn't look like the girls we were competing against. Like I'm short. And at that point I still very much had my figure skating body and, you know, bigger quads and a bum than <laughs> you'd expect to see on an NCAA athlete as a, on, you know, the picturesque distance runner. Um, so I think that played into it a lot and just the pressures from the coach. Like it's a different program. I, my high school coach, I'd had my entire high school career. It's somebody brand new. There's not a, there's not a, a courting phase. It's your, you go from one relationship directly into the next and you don't really get to date. You don't get to, mm -hmm. you know, figure out, if it's, if it is a good match for you, you, you try to on paper, but before you get there. Uh, so I think it was just that, just a little bit of burnout coming in to start my season or my career collegiate career. Uh, maybe not the best mate if a coach, uh, for my college career and just a lot of body image issues. I mean, like he never directly targeted me in those first few months, but I would overhear him telling other girls, you're, you're looking more healthy than you did last season. And, you know, so it, as a freshman, he, that pressure didn't get put on me 
but it wasn't like I, I didn't walk into a very pressured situation. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that there was some remarks not made to you, but to other people about, you know, um, when you were saying healthy, kind of inferring that it was, you know, as you were getting leaner, it was kind of being that way or like you were being healthy or the other way. When there, well, yeah, when he was referencing, when he was referring and making these statements to the other girls on the team, he was saying they're softer than they were when they finished track. Like you're looking a little fuller, you're looking a little healthier. Uh, and as somebody who was already lining up, feeling full and healthy, um, I didn't, I didn't need him to say it to me. I could kind of tell, like that was the, you know, if he's look, if you're standing in a group of five girls. And he's kind of looking at you all, but making like addressing it to two or three of you. Mm-hmm. It's addressed to the group, or at least as an 18 year old freshman, you're going to take it as addressed to the group. Mm-hmm. And how did you, how did that kind of affect you? Did, did those remarks affect you in any way? Or did, was it just you were confident enough in who you were? Oh, no, I spent the, my entire college career doing what most NCAA females do and, tr- you know, trying not to eat, trying to eat very little, trying to cross train and over train and run all the miles so that I could offset what I did eat. Like I, you name the eating disorder trick and I, you know, I did it and we saw it very much. I was on crutches twice in my freshman year, I think three times sophomore year, I think junior year, maybe only once. Cause then I finally got to be redshirted a bit. Um, like just, the majority of my college career was on crutches, uh, getting bone scans, spending my summers cr- swimming, spending most of the season swimming. I, I actually joked that it wasn't until pretty much law school that I actually had to run through the winter because usually by Christmas I was so injured mm. that I'd come back and do most of my workouts in the pool and race indoors off of cross training. And then, then summer would come and I'd run in the spring and summer and then be heard again by the end of the NCAA track season so absolutely and I think as you mentioned it it isn't just that your college it is you know pretty standard across the board within the NCAA system and and I myself I mean I remember I lost uh I think 12 pounds from my freshman year to sophomore year because similar to you coach had been making remarks to other people about um losing weight and it rubbed off onto me and what could, what do you think from your perspective now that you have kind of got a healthy relationship and it's great that we're already talking about this because this is one of the things I did want to ask you about um but from your experience um is there anything you think that can be done I mean we can obviously be the role models that these people look up to but what what do you think can be done um to ch- kind of change that perspective well I think if girls look like it's not sustainable and I think if we make that the topic of conversation that, yeah, you know what, if you want to weigh 90 pounds in college, you might be a decent NCAA runner, but look at the girls that are making it on the world scene and that have had lengthy careers. Like, I'm not going to deny that when I lined up in Rio, my, my build was very different than my off season size, but it ha- I let it happen naturally. And you just, I, I, f- I eat chocolate every day. I, s- I refuse to cut out my beer. I'll have my beer on weekends. But that's the difference is right now I'm in my off season. I might have beer with dinner most nights. In season, I limit it to weekends. So I'm not restrictive, but I have to recognize that my bo- I need to be making sure every calorie and piece of food and beverage that's going to my body is servicing my body. So when I get to Rio, when I get to world champs, I'm I'm able to compete and be my best Lanny. But I think if we draw that atten- draw the attention to that for girls is your body's your equipment and it's our engine. And it's very much like we can't be 200 pounds and line up and do what we do. But that doesn't mean that if your body's naturally meant to be a bit bigger and muscular and fuller, that that's a bad thing. Like once I finally accepted, I was never going to get rid of these figure skating quads and started training them to benefit me and staying in the gym and doing more squats and lower body work, the better runner I became. And I think that's part of it is just girls and women, we need to embrace the builds and the bodies that we have. Understand that you can train it and tweak it to fit within your sport and within the goals you want. But I have no business weighing 95 pounds. I, for the, the amount of muscle I have on my body, I, there's, there's no point. 
I also can't race my best at 130 pounds because that's too much size on my little frame. So for each athlete, it's about finding that balance and stop comparing. And I think in the NCAA system or any collegiate system, because you see it in Canada and it's now university sports, I think it used to be CIS, you see girls on teams, if one starts to struggle with a problem, then maybe the next one and then the second. And the joke was always, you take a girl, a cross country team of girls out to dinner, you never want to be the one ordering first, but you also don't want to be the one ordering last. Because if the first one to order, you're going to actually order food. And then the, next, the girl next to you is going to order something slightly less and then slightly less. And you get down to the seventh girl and she feels like she can only order water. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so it's the, it's the mindset within these teams and whether it comes directly from the coach or like you and I, we weren't actually told by our coaches our freshman year to lean out, but we got the message pretty quick by the comments made to other runners. Mm-hmm. And so that's part of it is like it, you don't have to directly call a girl fat to make her feel fat and that she needs to lose weight or lean out. She can very much, we can read between the lines quite well. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it is what I've been speaking about and trashed about uh, lately is media and other athletes and people within our sport or outside our sport. Don't comment on my body outside of it. It's, it's sporting purpose. You know, like I, I don't run to have you thinking I have a nice bum or to check out my rack or lack thereof or anything <laughs> like that. Like if you want to comment and say I have muscular quads or I, for, a, for a distance runner, I'm muscular. Yeah, that's my equipment and my equipment's on display and my equipment is what allows me to do what I do. Comment on it that way. And I think if we change that conversation for women in sport, then there's not going to be the same insecurities for girls and there'll be less pressure to look a certain way and do stupid things to look that way. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes from all, all aspects. And I, girls are hit with it outside of sport. We, we have magazines telling us how we're supposed to look all the time. Then within our sport, we all think a certain body type is going to run faster. We all nitpick and hear it from each other we all hear each other's insecurities because we all talk about our bodies so much and then we have just pressures from coaches or the fact that if you lose a couple pounds you're going to run faster that you're going to see a result but then you lose a few more pounds and you don't run any faster and you run worse and there's just nobody wants to call each other out or call the coaches out or the staff out when that's happening to a girl, mm-hmm. everybody waits for her to blow up. And then her teammates are like, well, yeah, I noticed she, she's she been eating sugar packets. Well, why didn't you say something sooner? Like, yeah. it's just, there's, there's too many variables out there that girls in sport and in cross country and distance running, unfortunately, are trying to balance. And if people, if we could just start eliminating those variables, mm-hmm. like take out some of the, the stressors and the problems and just have open dialogue. And I think that's what I've been trying to do. And you know what, if people really want to tear into me for doing so, then by all means, like I'm, I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to keep doing it. Oh no, I, I hear you. And anyone who has been listening for a while knows that this is something that I've really been chasing after as well through my blog, through any channel I can kind of get my, my voice heard because it is so important. And, um, you know, there's so many directions I could take this in. And I think one thing to note that you did mention, but just to, um, summarize was about the college system and how, um, it is, dangerous like you said a team of girls um in particular but it it is also a little bit you're starting to see it with guys as well where you know you'll see this one runner who will lose some weight and they will just take off like they'll start doing really well and um and then other people start to copy but what you don't see is the other side and I mean people can sometimes get away with it with it for a year or two but then everything comes crashing down so it's difficult for us to kind of see when we're in that moment you know someone who was maybe behind you is now way better than you but to trust that they're gonna you don't want them to fail but you kind of know that it is going to come crashing down and it is tough to be around that but um and I've it's funny you mentioned about the the going out to dinner thing because I still even sometimes struggle with that with even even with some elites I see that as well where um you know one person 
I'll order and then someone else will order something smaller and it, it makes you feel bad about yourself um, because um, you feel like you're being the pig. Um, but how do you um, stop yourself from comparing like nowadays? Like you mentioned about when you were in Rio, when you were in Rio and you were standing on the start line. Um, and I've talked about before how when we do stand on the start line, you know, runners at mine and your level two will look around and think, oh, wow, look at that girl. She looked really ripped or look at that person. They look really strong or whatever. How do you stop yourself from doing that or stop those thoughts kind of taking over? Uh, well, I'm not going to lie and say that I'm perfect at it. And like, there, I certainly have times in my life where I almost feel like a failure because I've let those thoughts come back in and, and very much affect my day or what I do. But I've actually, it's more in my personal life I've found that I'm, I struggle with that. In my sporting life, I've I've managed to flip a switch and just say no, like, no. Like it's, you're, you're going to run just as fine looking this way as, and you're actually going to run worse if you try to look that way. I'm very happy with the career I'm having in my sport, but a part of me regrets not getting my head on straight sooner because who knows what I could have been doing in my 20s. Had I not been just, you know, wasting away and wasting my time and wasting my talents trying to fit into other people's definitions of what a runner looks like or what a runner should be. Uh, and that those are years I'll never get back. And I have to just accept it. But I certainly am not going to now waste my 30s making the same mistakes. Uh, and if I can be vocal and help some 24, 25 year old mm -hmm get her head on straight sooner. And maybe she gets to have, you know, make an extra Olympic team or, you know, run some faster PBs then fantastic. Cause yeah, I find it's more the parts cause I was, it's, it was rampant in figure skating too. So it's not like I became a runner and all of a sudden had my head up my butt and didn't know how to eat like a normal human. It very much happened in, in the figure skating world too. And so it's been, that's been my mindset more of my life than, this, you know, straighter head Lanny mindset has been. So those demons are always going to be there. And I think part of it is because now as a, mm -hmm. a 32 year old adult woman, I'm, I'm aware of what I look like when I'm in court and I'm aware of trying not to look like a little girl because my sport's going to make my body a bit leaner and slent more slender than the other females in court, but then also not trying to look like a, a vamp and having my heels too high or my skirts too tight. Like there's other pressures on me outside of sport, even that I'm battling my sporting body to conform into normal society still. So that's where I, I feel like a failure sometimes when my, my mm. brain, that part of my brain can't catch up, but my sporting brain is so flipping annoyed with me for not figuring it out sooner that I can listen in my sporting world. And it's more just dealing with the struggles in your day-to-day -day life that um, if I have a bad day, it's in my normal life, not necessarily in my running life. Mm, very true. And great advice. Like, I love that. I never, I ne never would have even thought about that, but it is true that it does kind of run off into into our day-to-day -day life and a lot of the listeners you know um well I'd say almost all of the listeners are not you know never going to run in the Olympics or never going to you know run for their country or anything like that but they you know obviously will still have a lot of um self-confidence issues and and like you mentioned I'm sure some of that is within the professional and the personal world as well and um, if you don't mind me asking you mentioned about you know your weight fluctuating um, when you're you know just before a big race or at a big race and the rest of the year. Um, so what would you kind of like to say to anyone listening who may look at, um, you know, pictures of you from Rio or any, you know, professional runner from the peak of their season and think, wow, I am never going to look like that. What would you like to say to kind of reassure them that, like you said, you don't look like that year round and maybe how much your weight kind of fluctuates just to kind of give them a bit of an idea. If you mid, mid stride in a championship style race or a peak race of our season. Like I try to do a good job and make sure there's pictures out there of me when I'm not in season, whether they're casual Lanny pictures or even training pictures of me where I, I'm, I'm fuller and I, I work out a lot in my off season. So I put on a lot of weight and it's primarily muscle, but it's also just 
my beers and burgers. <laughs> because like, if you look at any picture of an elite athlete in any sport, it's not sustainable for us to look like that. And you try to dial it in for maybe four to six weeks where it's really important. And that's when, if you're a shorter distance runner in the milers, like they can race weekend after weekend and they have a very tight period that they do that for us, our window is even shorter for the marathon. Um, and if for throughout a marathon build, I make the joke that my mileage comes up and my, my weight might come a bit down. But then as soon as I cross that finish line after the marathon, then the mileage goes to zero and the weight comes right back up. For me, there's usually a good, it can be anywhere from about eight to 12 pounds difference, depending on how much time I'm taking off from proper running, how much I'm in the gym, cross training and lifting. But I typically, my race size is usually 104 to maybe 106 pounds, depending. Um, when I switched to the 10,000, I found that it, my weight kind of changes a bit differently. If I get any lower than that, I'm absolutely useless. I don't have power. I, I'm too tired. I'm a wimp. I just feel like a stiff wind will blow me over. Um, my off season weight is usually 110 to 112 pounds. Okay. So you're seeing a pretty size. Like I'm only five one on a five two on a good day if I stand up straight. Like <laughs> I'm not a very tall person, so that's that's a quite as percentage wise, it's a pretty substantial gain mm -hmm. uh, we see. And then I I have to be careful because I when I train at altitude. You, you lose weight at altitude. And if, if I go to Kenya in February, I have no business getting down to 104 pounds mm -hmm. by the end of February if I want my season to go till the end of August or I typically do a fall marathon. So mm -hmm. if I'm wanting 10 months of my season, I have to make sure when I start my serious training in the mid to late winter, I don't all of a sudden, I don't drop down to, to race mm -hmm. weight. It's mm -hmm. something... Um, last year I didn't do a good job of, I got kind of sick in Kenya, so I lost too much weight and I had to work with our sports physiologist to, to come back up in the spring and then hit the reset button and, and dial it back in to be ready for Rio. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that's really, you know, really good for people to hear and good for people to see. And, um, and just one more question before I want to kind of, uh, slightly changed direction um so you mentioned a few minutes ago about um you know you you know that your legs are more muscular you know that you're strong but just I don't know if you've noticed this but I found a lot of the words that are kind of used for men or maybe even just strong words are kind of people see them women see them as like almost a negative like muscular is sometimes seen as a bad word or I think I feel mm -hmm. like strong is like the only one that kind of can somewhat people can get away with and um you know I I feel the same way as you I do a lot of weightlifting I do you know all this stuff to keep I have chocolate I have sweets every single day um but uh, a lot of those words kind of have negative connotations to them um do you have any thoughts on how we can kind of stop that being the case or maybe you know just change the thinking with anyone listening yeah like I actually my girlfriend and I uh Kate Van Buskirk we're talking about this the other day because she's a very tall girl and she runs the 1500 and she's beautiful, but she's, she always in our world feels big and big as a, as a bad word yeah. in our world, but she's, she's almost six feet. I'm five one. Like us running down the street together is hilarious. Her brain should never think she needs to weigh in the low one hundreds, but just by her size alone, she's going to weigh more or have, you know, bigger muscles. But there's that word again, big or beast. She's a beast. Mm -hmm. I I have no problem that I, I call my like, you know, thunder mm -hmm. thighs. But that's just it's been a joke in my family for years because we grew up figure skating. We all had really big quads. Mm -hmm. Like I have to get my jeans to fit my quads and then get the waist taken in. Like it's yeah. just it's it's how life is. And yeah, it's just I don't know. I think it's words that are used outside of sport as well are part of the problem too. So it's not like big is always a bad word for women. It's just for some reason it is mm -hmm. uh, muscular broad. Mm -hmm. She's, you know, she's, she's, but she's built like a brick shit house. Like it's, yeah. it should just be strong and it should just be fierce and it should, it should still be termed sexy. 
And I, I've, you know, that seems to be a phrase that I've, I've coined and said a lot is what I do is fierce and sexy, not what I, not how I look doing it. And I don't know why we can't still see a very muscular body as attractive in women. It's, oh, she's muscular. She's pretty. She's muscular. Or with our throwers, you know, people go, oh, wow, she's actually a pretty girl. Well, why wouldn't she be a pretty girl? Like, why does she, like, you you hear these things and you're just kind of, she's out there as an athlete and she's hurling something through the air (laughs) that I could only hope to pick up off the ground. And you're shocked that there's still a feminine quality to her or that she's pretty. Like, it's just, at what point are we absolutely just athletes? At what point can our athleticism be commented on? And in which case terms like big and bold and broad are good words. And if you, if you, we change the, the way we talk about women in sport and not, Oh, she's look, she can be feminine or she is pretty or wow. For a pretty little thing, she runs really fierce. Like, stop it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Our equipment, our bodies are how we do what we do. And if you want to talk about the lines of our bodies in terms of how Emma Colburn jumps over the steeples and the physicality of her body doing that, great. That she's beautiful in her own right. That's a separate conversation. Mm -hmm. That's outside of sport. And I think until we separate the two, we're not going to be able to to have girls feel badly when they're told that they're they've got some nice big legs there mm-hmm. or that you know that thrower's got some big broad shoulders mm-hmm. like until we separate that and for men as well cuz you know distance guys deal with it too they yeah. they're there we all end up looking like prepubescent boys yes and um for the distance guys, like they're on the same team with these, you know, th- sprinters and hurdlers and throwers that are big, burly men. So it's it's on both g- sides of d- the, the gender conversation and both sides, I think, could benefit from the conversation being about our, our, our machines and what we're doing with them. Mm-hmm. And then any leave the other comments for this for stupid fashion magazines and stupid worlds outside of sport. Yes, exactly. And yeah, I often tell people like focus on what your body has accomplished, what it's achieved rather than what it looks like um, in that moment, you know, just focus on your own strengths and what you have as your best. Um, and you did talk about this recently in um, in front of um, Parliament in Canada, which is amazing and very brave of you. And um, what kind of made you decide to do this and kind of uh, take a stand with, um, you know, a higher level um, with this topic? Um, Well, I was asked to do it and I, you know, I figured it was an opportunity that I I shouldn't overlook. I was training for New York and I thought maybe it was an extra stressor, but I've gone to the Olympics. I've made every team I want to make. And now at this point, it's about having a career. I'm very much in control of the career I want to have. And if I want to make more teams and I wanted to do well in New York, but the times I run, the records I set or have, the teams I make, like that's just titles and accolades you can put beside me, beside my name on a piece of paper. The My legacy in sport and helping to change anything in sport, like that's something that's more important to me at this phase. So mm-hmm. when I decided to go do it, I wanted to go and I was nervous. I was nervous that I was going to walk into a room where everybody was going rah, rah, rah. Team Canada and our women did so well. And I'm not, I wasn't, I don't want to detract from how well our women did at the Olympics, but I very much still felt like there could have been so much more focused on, on our women's team in the Olympics. And maybe had we not have had such a successful team, And it's such a successful opener with our swimmers doing so, so well. Maybe there wouldn't have been this attention on women in sport at the Olympics this summer for Canada. And that's kind of my question and my fear. So when I went to Parliament, when I went to the House of Commons to speak to the Heritage Committee, I wanted to be clear that we've come a long way, and but there's still so much more we can do. Our history in sport is, is so short. I'm 32 years old. The first women's Olympic marathon was run in 1984 when I was born. Mm -hmm. So you're wanting to celebrate such small things when there's still, our history has still been one of restriction and control versus like completely 
open and access for women. And then we're still very much put in these boxes and controlled and commented on by being too old for our sport, by being, you know, the young and up and coming thing, by being too pretty to, to be a thrower or too little and pretty to be a runner or too big to be a runner. And there's so much going on in sports still. And there's, we're, there's so many little girls who don't pursue it or stay in it because of, you know, their own self-conscious, um, issues, self, yes, issues with self-confidence and just, it's a, it's a hard world out there and it's a hard thing to want to be a athlete, to be a professional athlete, and then to be a professional female athlete. And so I wanted my words to carry more weight and to have more meaning than any title or PB or anything beside mm -hmm. my name. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what have you kind of come to the conclusion or maybe, maybe you haven't, but what would be your suggestion to, you know, men and women listening of how we can be good role models, how we can kind of stop this, these sexist comments, stop this kind of conversation going? I think it's just, it's, I haven't come to a conclusion and it's mm -hmm. something that I'm, cause I have, I've encountered very much in my career, a lot of men that want to do the right thing by women and want to, to help in our, our, our feminist movement or be part of it. Uh, but I almost feel like women, we feminism and feminist is a bad word for us. We don't even like using it, but a guy can stand from the hilltops and shout that he's won and he's congratulated for it. Um, and I don't, I don't understand why I don't understand my own fear. It's only been in the last couple of years that I've even self-identified as a feminist and been okay to use that word. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's because I've noticed so many men using it, but then they're all, they want to be helpful and their intentions might be good. But then saying something like, oh, I had to go pack this up and it was a, a whore of a job. Well, are you a, are you a feminist or are you not? Because mm -hmm. our language is very much important and the words you use to describe things need to not be derogatory, even if your intention in that moment wasn't to be. Mm -hmm. um, and when I have my own teammates and colleagues commenting on my, bo my body in a way that isn't commenting on my equipment and my machinery, but then wanting, you know, to call it pointing the finger at other men when they've done something wrong, it's frustrating. And I think, we're, and I'm not saying I'm good at it and I'm, I, I struggle and I, you know, I, I'm sure I, I use derogatory language at times that I don't, I, my intention isn't to be that way, but if I'm having, I'm self-policing as best mm -hmm. as I can. Mm -hmm. And I can only expect others to do the same for themselves. And I think if we keep not teaching men, cause that sounds very, uh, like I'm, t I'm talking down to them, but if we keep the dialogue open of what we as women in sport, what our expectation is of how we're treated. And if mm -hmm. we're open and honest about that, then the men that truly want to be part of it and are, are, are on this, not on the sidelines, but they're standing there saying like, we're feminists too. We, we want, we don't want to get in your way, but we want to be helpful. They'll have a better idea of, of what that expectation is mm -hmm. and what they're signing on for. Cause I think we're afraid to use the word they might use the word not fully understand understanding its meaning. Uh, and I think until we all kind of get on the same page with that, mm -hmm. like it's not a bad word. What do we mean by being a feminist and a role model and a, you know, a strong female advocate? What does that mean? And it can be slightly different for everybody, but you know, let's not call something that's hard to do a whore of a job. Mm -hmm. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's be mindful of our words and, and, work together towards something as opposed to trying to be a feminist, but not too feminine is I'm failing at it miserably. And I, but a guy's not feminine at all, but he can be a feminist. Like it's just, yeah. yeah. And it's, um, you know, do you, do you see much of, I mean, I don't know your experience, but I've seen a lot of, you know, women kind of, uh, we also can kind of do it to ourselves sometimes can be kind of catty and bitchy. And, um, you know, you see, women kind of putting each other down rather than working with one another to kind of keep moving this in the right direction. Have you had much experience with that or is it mostly from, you know, men to women that you see this? No, it goes both ways. It's 
women are mean. We're, we're hard on, we're harder on each other and on ourselves than anybody, any man ever will be. And I don't, I don't know why that is. Um, but yeah, it goes both ways. Like men will comment on our bodies because some men just straight up think that our bodies are out there to be commented on. Um, not all, but, and then women, we very much want to tear each other down to build ourselves up. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's because we pick up on how, you know, men look at us and view us. And so we fall in line with that Mm -hmm. maybe. And if, you know, if the perfect example is after the house of commons, there was an online thread about me saying that I wasn't allowed to request that you comment on my performance, not my look. Like if you're going to comment on my butt, comment on it being muscular, don't comment on it looking nice. But because I run in a sports bra and bun huggers, Mm -hmm. like the little bikini bottoms, I'm not allowed to say that because by running in that uniform, I'm asking to be objectified. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just women. It wasn't just men saying that it was women as well Mm -hmm. that I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because there's pictures of me in cocktail dresses on my Instagram or in a bikini at the beach with my girlfriends. And that's men and women were, were saying these things and say what you want. I have a pretty thick skin. So it really, that part didn't bother me. What bothered me was what little girl didn't get to take away the positive message of what I was saying, because she might follow this online thread and mm-hmm. see that I, I got torn apart by not just men, but by women as well. Yes. Yeah. I was very much t- commenting on, especially young girls going through puberty, how you feel so awkward in your body and you're trying to hide it. And then if you're in a sport, if you're in, heaven forbid, you're in swimming or diving or gymnastics or figure skating or running where we run in, t- in smaller, tighter garb, And you're going through puberty and you're so self-conscious of your body and people are out there commenting on your body and not your athleticism and not what you're accomplishing. Well, look at the numbers. We're losing girls in sport from like the age of puberty on. And that's what I was commenting on is like, if you stop speaking about my body as some sexual object or how sexy I look or fierce I look doing something and start commenting on how powerful and fierce and maybe sexy what I did was Mm -hmm. then maybe that 15 year old girl sees that and understands that her body when she's in sport can be fierce and it's what she can accomplish with that body can be amazing Mm -hmm. not she's not amazing because of how she looked doing her sport yeah and that message was wiped out almost by some of the comments from men and women Mm -hmm. online Mm -hmm. and so it's I'm not saying every woman has to champion the girl beside her because we're, you know, you might not always agree with the words that are being said, but you don't have to tear down either. You can agree to disagree and just move on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've had very similar experiences, maybe not to the level that you have because of the kind of stage you put yourself on with the talking in front of parliament, but I've had written um, articles for other websites and had, um, you know, made, made remarks that I felt like um like sent kind of same thing as you you know I'm proud of my strong quads and I'm you know I feel like things are getting better and people like you said men and women are like a lot of women actually saying you have no right to say this um you know just sim- very similar to you so it is it is tough and it does make it difficult for anyone to kind of put themselves out there especially when you have websites like let's run or some of those other forums that just you know spend their whole day doing that so it's difficult and you know, I think, like you mentioned, just the discussion of it is is going to keep helping. I'm glad you also brought up about, you know, the remark they made saying that, you know, by wearing this tight, revealing clothing, you know, are, you're, are we making it worse? That is something I was going to kind of ask you about because, you know, I have heard that argument before, but I think you kind of covered that correctly. And uh, you're right that it, it shouldn't be about what we're wearing, no matter what we are wearing. So thank you for being so honest and, and raw with your you know, thoughts and feelings there. And then, so just one other thing uh, that I wanted to ask you about, kind of another thing that was a bit controversial that you did, but again, something I admired and really thought was was brave was um, if you wanted to tell us about the double-double debacle (laughs) that happened this year. And uh, we do have a lot of US listeners, so maybe how it's different to qualify um, for something like the Olympics in Canada or the UK compared to the US. 
Yeah. Uh, so unlike the U.S., um, for just for ten thousand and up, we don't have a trials because we just don't have the depth in Canada. So you run the qualifying time, and if you're one of the top three in the country with it within the qualifying window, you've ticked your boxes. We have this proof of fitness thing you have to do as well, where you have to demonstrate later in the window um, if you qualified at the opening of the window. That you're, you've not been sitting on the couch eating potato chips, I guess. <laughs> I ran the 10,000 meter standard at Stanford 2015. I ran it, I ran even faster again at Peyton 2015. So I had Olympic standard in, in the 10,000. I had two standards. And for the marathon, I ran in October 2015, I ran 229.08. Our Olympic standard for the marathon was substantially faster than the IOC. It was 229.55. So I have two standards in the 10, one standard in the marathon. I had to, within the year of 2016, run under Olympic standard again. I had to run 32.15 or better in the 10,000. And I had to run under 113 for a half marathon to show that I was ready for the full marathon. Even though to I had, they'd already had my, my training plan for the year, what altitude camps I was going to do, roughly what mileage I'd be hitting to prove that I'm not sitting on the couch eating potato chips. I still had to like retick these boxes. And I did so easily first try, not easily, but like I didn't have to go back and ask them to adjust my times or give me another opportunity. I did what I was told. And then the, the window for the marathon closed in May, 2016 and I got a call from our head coach saying that they were going to wait to nominate me for the marathon until they did the entire team nominations in July. But they had nominated the other marathoners at this point for selection for the team. So I was going to have to wait another six weeks. And it, they weren't saying no. They were saying not now. But the discussion for the last year had been pretty much like, why, like, can she double Physi- physiologically, is it possible in such a short time frame? You should focus on the 10,000. You said Tokyo would be the year you want to focus on the marathon at the Olympics. So there'd been enough discussion leading into that phone call with the head coach that I didn't take it as a not now. I was taking it as a, a soft no, but we can't really say no to you until later anyways. And by and that's when lawyer Lanny kicked in because mm-hmm. by the criteria – by anything you'd set out in front of me, I ticked all the boxes. You nominate me to that team. There's no not now. There's nothing that gives you that the decision making capability to delay or deny. You just, you can't, there wasn't a clause in the criteria. Uh, So it became this big media storm and over those six weeks leading up to the team selection. And I was, you know, I was threatened that if I was vocal about it, any further beyond the first few interviews I did that I'd be given a member conduct violation and that could prohibit me from fund from continuing to be funded for the rest of the year. It could keep me from being named to the team period. So I very much had to shut up. Like it was basically a gag order, but the running community and everybody else was able to be vocal. And then I found out with everybody else in July, what events I'd be competing in a month later at the Olympics. So it was, it was stressful. I still trained. It was frustrating, um, more so because like lawyer Lanny just straight up, it mm-hmm. it didn't make sense. It wasn't right, um, and it shows how little power as athletes we have when our federation wants to say or do something. Like, what am I? What what am I supposed to do? And I think that's why I'm gonna be the advocate because I'm I'm fortunate. I come in with a with an education that's trained me to do so, mm-hmm. and. If I were 20 year old Lanny and the same issue had come up, I don't know what I would have done. And there certainly wasn't somebody before me kind of standing up and being vocal and saying, this is the criteria. You wrote it. You follow it. Mm-hmm. You don't get to bend the rules here. And so that that's what the double, double debacle was, mm-hmm. was me very much saying, I didn't agree with your rules to begin with, but I followed them. You don't get to bend them now. Like you come to the table with the same restrictions that I, I started out with. Absolutely. And and did that affect your, you know, you said that you got told four weeks to go and you have described uh, somewhere I read or listened to said that your your build up was ugly, as you put it. Um, <laughs> so 
did that affect you mentally, like knowing that you didn't know what you were doing? And how did you feel the Olympic experience was um, considering that? Yeah, um, I just, the the stress of not knowing, I, we, my training plan, we didn't, we didn't alter. We did the same training. The problem was, was the stress of it was affecting training. Um, and I just wasn't going into workouts as recovered as I needed to be, or as much as I was told to shut up, the community didn't. And I'm so grateful that they didn't. But anytime there was another article that came out, it was very much, is this head coach going to assume that I'm actually orchestrating all of this from behind the scenes when I'm not, the community is speaking right now. Like you're, Mm -hmm. everyone can, everyone else can see you're in the wrong. You're not seeing that. And I'm here having to kind of play monkey in the middle and go, I, you told me to shut up. I've shut up, you know, but I'm, I will not tell them to shut up because you, your gag order essentially says I'm not to speak on this period. Why am I going to speak on it to become, to come to athletics Canada's aid? Why am I going to speak on it to tell them to shut up because athletics Canada is starting to look poorly? Well, you've made your bed. You lie in it. You either let me talk about it fully or I'm not talking about it at all. And mm-hmm. they they have the megaphone, and by all means, I'm going to let them run with it. It's not not my place to tell them to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not your place to tell them to stop either. But that it was stressful, and we we saw it. And it wasn't as soon as I was named in both, and I went home to London, and I was training with my coach for the final three or four weeks. We just saw training get right back in line, and I very much had the Rio experience I'd set out to have and that I wanted. Um, I raced to the best of the abilities that I could, and I was very happy with how I raced. I can't let my brain play the what if game. Like, what if, you know, I didn't lose those six weeks of of focused, happy training? Because, <laughs> like, that's just, you can just drive yourself nuts doing mm-hmm. that. That's like mm-hmm. going over a breakup and trying to figure out what you did wrong. Like, just don't do it. Something went wrong, move on. And that's kind of how I ha- I choose to view my real buildup and my real races. Was I was as prepared as I could be on the day. I pulled out performances that I'm very, very proud of. And I'm so proud and honored to have had the support from the running community across the globe. Cause that, Mm -hmm. that really shows where I've come in the last four years, um, where the running communities, how far the running communities come. And hopefully that if I'm continuing to be this kind of, you know, girl that's willing to poke the bears, you know, people are, are paying attention and appreciating it. Absolutely. It definitely does seem to be the case from what I see. And I didn't mention it earlier, but I will put a link to that speech you did or the, the talk you did at Parliament. Um, and I'll put that in a link in the show notes in addition to some blog posts that you've written recently about these topics. And I'll put it at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC141. And I'm glad that it did come together for you when it mattered. And that was stressful. And people who know me well know that I've gone through pretty similar uh, situation over the last year, not with the Olympics as such, but something very similar with um, with uh, Team GB. But it is difficult to be in. And, you know, it's great that you are deciding that you want to kind of chase it down and kind of make it a better place. And uh, so where do you go from here? Like what's what's next on the agenda for you running wise? You know, do you you are a lawyer, as you've mentioned. So do you plan to take your career in that direction a bit more or what's next? Uh, yeah, I'm still in my post New York recovery phase. So I, I'm back training and running, but purely for the joy of it and for what I want to, what I, why I was a runner all through law school. We'll start to decide what to do next season and the years to come uh, in the, the next couple of weeks. I actually fly to Tennessee today from Toronto to go work on a case that's due um, at the end of the week. So Mm -hmm. I'm very much still going to be a lawyer and just kind of continue with, I seem to do like doubles and do doubles well. So I'm going to continue with my double life there. Uh, Focus will still be on running, but I also, I'm not going to turn down opportunities to, to represent women in sport and represent, you know, if I get opportunities again to represent Canada in sport, I will. Bucket list races. New York was very much a bucket list and Mm -hmm. I'm running for me more this this quad than I did last quad, and I'm gonna take take that path and journey wherever it takes me. Uh, I very much might we might see this might be the transition of lawyer Lanny more from the criminal defense stuff that I do to more advocacy type work in in the sports setting. I'm kind of a very open minded person and easy going person in that way. Like I've I've made the mistakes of trying to hunker down and force myself into a situation, whether it was a job or a running location, et cetera. 
And I'm just going to not be so whimsical that I get blown any direction with the wind, but I'm also going to be more open to opportunities and just see where, where I end up in terms of my lawyer self and my running self. Mm -hmm. Probably feels pretty good. Although I do admire you for that one because I'm sure um, you're probably pretty similar. I think most people at the elite level are with a very regimented, so it can be difficult to kind of go with the wind. So um, good to hear that you're doing that. And, um, and just uh, because I'm sure people will be curious what we've talked about, um, you know, uh, body image and weight and eating and stuff when you said you like to kind of indulge and gain weight after after a marathon so you just ran New York a few weeks ago so what did the first few days after New York look like just so you can kind of show people just how real you are because I share it uh -huh. but I don't know if they think I'm a um I'm a uh, one of a kind with the way that I do it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, like it, it wasn't even the few days. It was a few hours after the marathon. I got picked for doping control and walked back to the hotel, walked back into the hotel for the testing. And there was a big spread out of food and there was donuts. And I just like, grabbed a donut and walked, walked on into doping control. Yeah, like it's a lot of what I, I eat anyways, chocolate, burgers, beers. There's just there's I have a rule. When I'm out of season, chocolate can be breakfast. When I'm in season, yes. chocolate can be part of breakfast. Um, <laughs> so there's been quite a few days in the past few weeks where my mornings, my day started out with chocolate as my meal. As I get back into training, it will still always be part of my meal. I always like having dark chocolate with whatever I have for breakfast. I uh, have had my fair share of burgers. Uh, there was a lot of New York pizza that was taken in right oh, after the race. So it's kind of like you'll see me eating stuff like that throughout my training and throughout my build. It's just like anything. Normally, it's in balance with life, and there's been less and less balance mm -hmm. lately. Uh, once I'm sure, once December and January comes, and my coach and I start talking, he might start question might start questioning with if I'm fully at it or if chocolate's still breakfast. That's usually his measure. <laughs> it's like is is chocolate still breakfast? Yep. Okay, we'll check in in a couple weeks and see when it's not. <laughs> that's so funny you mentioned that as well because that's usually the way that my husband knows I've like fallen off the wagon like you same as you I I, I eat chocolate I eat sweets every day um but I try and like rein it in that last like month but um he knows I've fallen off the wagon when like you chocolate is breakfast yeah. and uh it's not just <laughs> chocolate is breakfast it's chocolate is breakfast two hours later chocolate is a snack and two hours Lunch later, dinner. like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's good to know that you're, you know, very much the same way. And I think it's good for people to hear that as well. Um, that you keep it all the way through. It's not like, you know, um, elites get to that six weeks before and it's like every morsel that goes past your mouth must have a purpose and it does to an extent, but you still can't have to keep balance. And so it's important to keep those. And there are going to be some people who go that far, but for the most part, um, I think it's very healthy to keep some of your favorite foods in there. And you've definitely shown that balance today. So we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor and then we will be right to the final kick round. By now, you've probably heard me talk about how a Body Health Perfect Amino is the perfect blend of the eight essential amino acids to help you build and repair your muscles, your tissues, and of course, improve recovery. I take it along with their complete plus detox multivitamin. And during my recent marathon build up, I took Perfect Amino a few times a day, which allowed me to bounce back from my workouts quicker and to keep training hard so I could have a good race in the fall, which is kind of important, right? Have you used coupon code TINA10 yet? The Body Health team would love to hear your feedback. Yes, another reason I love them. And you can share your experience with Perfect Amino through the show notes for this episode by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Oh, and you can enter to win a six pack worth $230 there too. So once again, that link is runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. I wish you all the luck. This is the time of year many of us commit to being better and doing what we can to reach our goals. For me, it's doing more stretching and mobility work, and you've heard me admit it here, so hold me to it. But once the busyness of life, the nasty weather, and the tiredness from training accumulates in our legs, that motivation slips away, and it can be really hard to get it back. Now, we could reward ourselves with food, but after all that indulging over the holidays, most of us probably need to work on making better choices. 
We all know that new running shoes or new running clothes have a bit of a power to get us excited about running again, especially if they look stylish. The Saucony Freedom ISO has become my new favourite shoe, not just because they're nice to look at, but because the ever run soul gives back with every step. So even on my most tired day, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a push from the ground. I absolutely love them and I think you will too. So if you live in the US, make sure you use coupon code TINA to get 10% off your order at Saucony.com. Okay, Lani, just five more questions for you, um, starting with the greatest advice you've ever received. Greatest advice would be, um, you're a girl, you can change your mind. Mm. Uh, that's something my mom's always said. And it's not, it's not meant to make you wishy-washy and it can apply to boys as well. It's just, I changed my mind. I got two law degrees instead of one because I, I'd always wanted to go to law school, changed my mind. I changed my mind. I wanted to go to the Olympics and the marathon. I want, and then I changed my mind to do two events. And it's always, I've always taken it more to mean set your goals, but don't limit yourself by them. And sometimes some goals, the path and the journey you've set to, to reach them on, you have to change your path, but it doesn't mean you have to be afraid that your goal might slightly change as well. Ooh, I love that. That's great. And girls, we're not told we can change our minds. We can change our minds as much as we want. Just, you know, don't be afraid of change. Okay, great. Thank you. Really helpful advice. All right. What is your favorite running book or blog? Oh, uh, my favorite running book would have to be Running with the Kenyans. Okay. And it was, I read it the year after my first trip to Kenya, and it actually has a lot of the athletes and men and women that I know in Kenya in it. So it was actually a really cool read. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, What would you like to tell a new runner? Running's supposed to add to your life, not detract from it. So whether you're at my level or a beginner, and you're on a running program, like days off are going to happen. Life's going to happen. And the moment getting that run in makes you so stressed, you hate it. Re- rethink your day and your plan. Um, and I'm not saying you're going to run, love running every day. Like I always say, I'm, I love running. I'm not in love with running all the time. Uh, so just, it's, it's something I do because it adds very much to my life and it makes me who I am. But if there's a day, whether I'm full in training or in my off time right now, where getting that run in is just going to make me miserable, then what's what's the point? Just make sure you're doing it because it's your passion and you love it. Yes, love that. So important. Um, pre-race meal. What did you, what did you have before Rio? Uh, before the ten thousand. Um, oh, it's different. I, yeah, for because mm. I don't carb load for the ten th- for ten thousand. So before the ten thousand, it was just you're very much like I eat very protein heavy. So it was like some chicken and salmon, a bit of rice and a bit of vegetable. Uh, before the marathon, it was rice, potatoes, the tiniest piece of chicken, more rice, more potatoes, and pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, great. I guess that makes sense though. All right, and finally, favorite running product. Oh, my favorite running product. I, that's tough. Shoes are like, I, I run an Asics. I love my Asics shoes, but I actually have. Which um, shoes for my Asics? Just... I run in the Nimbus for my training runs and then I race in the Hyperspeeds. Okay. But I actually, I have uh, from Joshua Tree, it's a skincare company um, just outside of Michigan. And they have this healing salve that I use for mm. to stop chafing or if I do chafe. And it's good. It's, I use it on my lips. I use it if it's super windy and cold out, I can put it all over my face. Like it's just, it's always in my bag and it it works in any temperature in any setting. And what is it called? It's J tree life. J tree life. And, uh, yeah, it's their healing salve or salve S A L V E. And, uh, they have it for cyclists and climbers and everything, but I just, it's in my bag for running all the time. Okay, great. I will put a link in the show notes, which once again are at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC141. Okay, Lani, uh, what would be the best way for people to follow you if they want to kind of keep up to date with what you're up to? Uh, yeah, I have a website. It's just lannymarchant.com or .ca. Uh, both will pull you there. Uh, my Instagram is Lanny Marchant. My Twitter is a bit strange. It's LJM5252. And then, yeah, if you if you need to email, you can get get that through the the website as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, for being so open and honest and wonderful. Uh, really appreciate it, and I'm sure our listeners have got a lot out of today. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Isn't she awesome? I mean, how many elite runners do you know that talk about wanting to make real changes in our sport and want to make their legacy about things outside of their actual running ability? Not many, I can tell you that. I just love where she's going and I hope you got a lot out of it too. Tell her if you did. I'm sure she'd love to hear that she's got the support. And once again, those show notes are at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC141 if you want to leave her a comment. I'm sure she'll get back to you. So next week, we'll be talking to Rob Wilby of Oxygen Addict, and he talks to us about making the transition from running to triathlons. And even if you weren't tempted to try one before, you will be after this. Runners have a huge advantage over the other athletes, and you can learn more about how next week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 